The veteran suicide rate in the United States is an ongoing tragedy. Many vets who have taken their lives were wounded in the battlefield. Some believe those soldiers, disabled in combat, who are still high functioning, deserve the option of remaining in the military with a chance for a career of dignity rather than being forced out. This could help reduce the number of suicides, but right now, there is no such policy. Divisional colors carry 10 battle streamers from this war. With 467 days of combat time, the 82nd was decorated for the Sicily campaign. This is the jump off. This is Operation Homecoming, the last official mission of the All-American 82nd Airborne Division. Their objective, the four and a half mile parade route through New York City the largest big-time march for many who will never march again. When we send our troops to fight a war, we must understand the devastating long-term effects. Over 58,000 soldiers died in combat in the Vietnam War. But does anybody know that we lost more than twice that number to suicide in the years that have followed? None are so blind as those who will not see. None are so deaf as those who will not hear. And none are so numb as those who will not feel. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If you had asked me how many vets were committing suicide, I might have guessed one or two a day, but to learn that 22 every day are committing suicide, I just couldn't believe it. I was just absolutely shocked. And the kids were absolutely shocked too. They, they had no idea. In 2014, over 7,000 veterans committed suicide. 20 each and every day. Some vets think the actual number is much higher. Many still honor the number 22. Across the country, there is a movement to keep the focus on this ongoing tragedy until something is done to decrease the number of veteran suicides in our country. But is anybody listening?
My father was a big, strong guy, and he was born in Germany in 1900, and actually fought in World War I. But he loved being an American citizen, and he loved the American flag and what it stood for. And he would even tear up when he saw the American flag on TV and they were singing the national anthem. I really loved my father a lot in spite of our differences, and I always wanted him to be proud of me. So I decided to join the military, and he was pleased. But I had no idea of the effect of that decision on the rest of my life. I came down with an eye disease while serving in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, and soon after lost my vision completely. I was devastated, obviously. I was discharged out of the service and sent home. Didn't know quite what to do or which way to turn. My friends didn't know how to relate to me, and I didn't know who I was. Many veterans struggle with fitting in when they come home. Some actually feel as if they are prisoners of war in their own country. People uh, here recently have asked me, well, do you miss the Army? No, I don't miss the Army. I miss soldiers. Uh, I miss the interaction. I miss the support. You become somebody else. I don't know who I am now. You understand that people get hurt. You understand that people get killed. But what we do can take away all hope. It can take away your identity. It can take away your belief in just about everything. And we have to find a way to give it back to them. We have to. I had uh, a lot of disabilities while I was on, in service. That I, uh, My knees were so bad I couldn't run anymore. Uh, I have a, a problem, it's called dumping syndrome as a result of losing most of my stomach. Uh, these things didn't stop me from serving. Uh, I know of cases where people that were missing limbs we're allowed to continue to serve. There's a, there's a lot of wounds that I feel would not automatically put somebody out of service. They, it shouldn't. They, they're still able to contribute. There, there's, there's a lot of things they can do. Uh, you take an individual who's lost a, the use of their legs, there's plenty of things in the computer field that they can still contribute. You take a pilot that's been injured in an airplane crash and, and can no longer fly. I think there's a lot of people that are being forced out due to disabilities that could continue to serve, could continue to feel a part of the military. And uh, it, it's just not right that we push them out. Veterans that have been discharged, that had a, had a career planned, are, are suffered a great deal. Plus, they're put on disability. And uh, disability has its own positive side and then downside. If you're disabled and you're not doing anything for it, it becomes very hard to engage back in life. For many, many civilians have no idea how to talk to a veteran, especially a veteran that's been through trauma. No one was really focused on the, on the public. Everyone's focused on the veteran. And the more you focus on the veteran, the more the veteran is the victim. You've got to be injured, you've got to be screwed up, you've got to be broken, you've got to be disabled in order for us to be able to know what to do with you. But we need to have a broader sense of what it is to sacrifice your life for the rest of your life. It's altered. And there needs to be a way that that gets honored and in in, in, uh, acknowledged by the public. Thank you for calling Kingston VA Clinic. If this is a life-threatening emergency, please hang up and dial 911. If you are having thoughts of harming yourself, please press zero to be routed to a veteran's crisis line or hang up and call 1-800-273-8255.
And even the Veterans Administration is now acknowledging the tragic reality of the situation. My name is Emily Sachs. I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, and one of my areas of specialization is war trauma. Um, so I've worked with refugees and survivors of torture from around the world, and I've also worked with American soldiers and veterans as a staff psychologist at a Veterans Affairs Medical Center uh, specializing in post-traumatic stress disorder and chronic pain treatment. Pain can't be completely avoided. Um, and importantly, that that's actually what makes him the same as everyone else, not different. I mean, that's the thing, that it's his humanity that hurts when a comrade dies and he survives. And so that hurt is actually a sign of health. And that's what we often miss. It's one of, one of the beauties of being, being with soldiers is the most strenuous, most heartbreaking things, they find a way to get through and they bring you with them. And I think that's why the camaraderie at Soldiers is so strong, is we share these experiences. I, I gotta tell you, in the last few years, it's been hard because I'm gonna miss Lieutenant Colonel Kelly Hodge a lot. His retirement tour was working for me doing global force management. And he was right where I am today. And he broke. And he's one of those statistics now. He took his own life. He didn't know how to adapt. I don't think we did enough for him. We missed something. On July 26, 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which required all businesses and corporations to make their work environments accessible to all people. The ADA also required all businesses to be equal opportunity employers and enforced penalties on businesses that continue to practice any form of discrimination based on disability. In the years since that law has passed, the standard of living for people with disabilities has improved greatly. In fact, currently over 13% of the federal workforce are people with disabilities. However, the one organization that has been exempt from needing to comply with this law has been, and still is, the United States military. It's actually uh, more conducive to the taxpayer to retain the service member because there's already been enormous investment the basic training, the advanced individual training, the MLS training, the unique skills training, including leadership schools that the individual uh, may have attended prior to. So, you know, when we lose a service member, uh, that requires a whole new accession and all that upfront cost to be able to prepare an individual for a certain responsibility. So, uh, in most cases, um, we actually, we the taxpayer, we benefit from uh, allowing for this disabled American um, who may have, have, have been wounded in battle or otherwise incurred these uh, disabilities to be able to continue to serve. See, during the Second World War, if you were still able, regardless of the disability you may have had, whether it was a missing leg, loss of vision, your skills were so important, your contribution was so important that it wasn't overlooked. We can't afford to lose good people. When you graduate from high school and you join the military thinking that hopefully it's going to be a career for you, and you go and you experience different things that affect, it, that affect you and uh, your state of mind, and then you come back, uh, it's almost like a feeling of helplessness because you're pulled away from what you know and uh, your camaraderie and your, your team and you get placed back into society where you don't have that. So I could see why many men and women uh, do the, the deed of suicide when they can't get help, they can't find a job and uh, there's no support mechanisms there for them. Although the VA does have a lot of programs in place uh, it's like a net. Some of these folks fall through the net. A significant number of these people 
if they were proper, properly retrained and allowed to remain. I, I think that would be a tremendous help. And with the vast number of suicides we're experiencing in our armed forces today, this needs to be looked at seriously. I think there's a direct correlation between those suicides and the lack of dis disabled people in the military. Our culture has always been confused about the disabled, and for a good reason. The images of the predator and the prey are etched in our brains from an early age. For the spider, it's one meal, but for the victim caught in the web, it's the end of life. An antelope with a disability has little chance in the animal kingdom. Survival of the fittest still rules the wild, and the shortened life all too often comes to a grueling and torturous end. How many times have we seen the prey fall victim to its predator? Yes, survival of the fittest has its cruel realities, but is this also a fact for human beings? Physical weakness for human beings used to lead to a horrible life most of the time, or even death. But times have changed. Now, people with disabilities have a good chance to live a meaningful life. But many of us still have in our minds that disability can feel like a death sentence. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Yet as we speak, there are officially 56 million disabled people in our country, about one out of every five people, and most likely there are thousands more who have not registered as disabled. You are either currently disabled or you are going to experience some form of disability in your lifetime sooner or later. Strong and healthy one day, and the next day, a life-changing disability? This happens to many of our soldiers, and the effects are often devastating to one's self-image. For our paratroopers that were maimed, uh, who had a desire to continue to serve, uh, I did everything I could, and in fact, in many cases successful, to retain them in service so they could continue, uh, including getting promoted and moving on and flourishing in service. And, um, you know, just doing everything I could for these guys uh, to make sure that they rise to their God-given potential. I felt empowered that if I had someone who really wanted to serve, and continue to serve, uh, that we could, we could make that recommendation. And if that meant they were kept in MOS, uh, military occupational specialty, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a great thing if they had that opportunity and physical capacity. But in other cases where they didn't have that physical capacity, that they could be reclassified into in a different military occupational specialty where they could continue to not only contribute, but really to flourish and to be promoted and uh, to really feel uh, respected and appreciated for their uh, unique abilities and for their service. September 2, 2006, about 20 miles southwest of Baghdad, Iraq, Ivan Castro was severely injured when his unit was attacked by enemy mortar rounds. He recovered after a number of surgeries, but lost his vision completely in the process. Having served for over 18 years prior to the attack, he went on to serve for another 10 years, this time as a totally blind soldier before retiring. I've been very blessed uh, to have served in the military. I came in the Army back in 1988, made it to the rank of uh, E7 and uh, Sergeant First Class, and I uh, went to OCS and got a commission. Upon uh, earning my commission, uh, it was an infantry commission as an infantry officer. I uh, went to the 82nd and deployed to Afghanistan and then to Iraq. You know, when after I was given the news that I, I lost my sight, uh, you could imagine that this is the only thing I, I had done for 18 years. This is what I loved to do. This was my passion, you know, and, and uh, my goal and dreams was to serve as long as I could. And it wasn't just 18 or 20 years. My goal was to go, you know, beyond 30 if, if I could have. And, um, you know, I told my uh, chain of command that I was willing to, uh, to do anything, anything that I, I, I had to do in order to stay in. Uh, and that, you know, with my experience and my will. There have been disabled soldiers who have been allowed to remain in the military, but only on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Interestingly enough, though, there is an obscure policy called continuing on active duty, which a few selected disabled servicemen can apply for, but only if they already have served for at least 15 years. My position after getting injured was being the executive officer for headquarters and headquarters company. Now that unit deployed and I was kept back as a re like rear, uh, rear detachment commander. So I had to deal with, uh, with all the issues of the unit that was deployed, plus the folks that were coming in, the casualties, and all the little uh, to-dos that were left behind at the unit. You know? and, and what it is is they provide automation um, for everyone in, in the government with any type of disability. And so they provided the software uh, for me to, at my work environment, to, for me to be totally independent. Well, there's a, a friend of mine and someone who's wrote, written, I think, a very, a very influential book on me called uh, War in the Soul, Ed Tick, uh, who talks about identity disorder being the contrib major contributor to suicide. And sort of what you were saying, you, you were blind, you came out of the military blind, and you had a whole new identity you had to figure out and locate. It's, a, it's similar to that for a, uh, a combat soldier or anyone that's leaving the military, whether you're injured physically or psychologically or just having to adapt to the fact that this is a completely different world. The doctors didn't know what to do, but I was screaming inside. I didn't know how to live this life. I didn't know how to handle this transition from sight to no sight. I had no idea what kind of future I could have. I was just trying to get by one day at a time. And to be honest, I got into drugs because at least it took away the pain temporarily. Things just got worse and worse. And I had no idea how bad they could get before they might start getting a little better. A lot of the time when I was losing my sight, I was still trying to look cool. I was still trying to look okay. And I was so embarrassed about losing my sight. At some point, I got involved with a supportive community of people who were very helpful to me. And when I stopped running from my blindness, my life started getting better immediately. It wasn't easy, but I was headed in the right direction. I remember one day I was just sitting around feeling frustrated with myself. And I just yelled, damn it, so I'm blind, so what? I'm still alive. I have a life to live here. I have to figure out how to do this. To survive If I get what I need to stay alive And I don't indulge in feeling so deprived I gotta make a move to get myself satisfied And you have the will to survive. Yes, you do. If you get what you need to stay alive. That's right. And yeah, you don't indulge in feeling so deprived. You gotta make a move to get yourself satisfied. fallacy that people that are blind live in darkness is not really the truth. For seeing individuals, they may see a blind person as living in darkness, but Marty always lives in the light. For myself, when I walk with Marty, the first thing I notice is we walk together. And in many of my relationships, either I walked ahead or he walked ahead, 
but not often did we walk together. With Marty, we walk together. I am more secure and happier in this relationship than I've been in any other relationship. I actually think that a mindset change is actually in order here because we often use the phrase dis disability, but uh, the, it's hard to quantify how enormously positive it is when human uh, incurs such trauma and they overcome that trauma that they become a unique and invaluable asset to the organization. These are incredibly inspiring stories. I think of Sergeant Major Cavazos. Uh, he was literally within eight hours of him being shot on one of my operations. I get a call from him and he was in Balad. So he wasn't even evacuated yet out of Iraq and he was calling me saying, sir, please don't give my position away. I want to come back. Now keep in mind, Sergeant Cavazos could have been killed in action. I mean, he was shot in the face with an AK-47 round. It's a miracle that he didn't die. And within eight hours, he was pleading with me to keep his job. He absolutely kept his job. He not only kept his job, uh, he excelled at it. And he was a source of just remarkable inspiration to my unit. So, I, you know, I want to say that I would not characterize what happened to Sergeant Cavazos as a disability, although it technically was one. Uh, it certainly qualifies for a disability. Uh, but what it really was, was this remarkable story of overcoming adversity that gave uh, just a real and significant value added to my organization. I say motivation comes from within. And, um, you know, if you're not motivated at the beginning, it's going to be a tough road for you. If you're not a go-getter and you're not motivated, it's going to be a really tough road. So you have to have a goal, a purpose. You have to be self-motivated. No one else can motivate you to do anything, you know. And uh, you have to really, you know, be, you know, accept the fact of the situation uh, and move on. You know, this is a, a risky business that we're in and uh, you know, you're subject to injuries or, or death. So you know, you know the consequences before joining the military. There's incredible resilience in people and if they are doing something, all their mental health issues begin to, to diminish because they're functioning. They, they have an identity. They have, an, they have a way that they produce and create in the world. I don't think there's anything more healthy than spontaneity and creativity in a human being's life. There's no med that does this. And I also think back that, you know, the Department of Defense and the Army led the way when it came to integration. We integrated the services long before we integrated our schools, long before we in integrated our communities. Why can't we lead in this piece? Why can't we be that same change agent we were back in the 1940s and the 1950s. My grandfather was in the Army. I mean, so a history of, um, of the men in my family being in service. Pretty much everybody um, who's been in service, I think you'll find a lot of African-American men during that era, which was the 50s and the 60s, they were actually volunteering to go into the service. Men and women from all races and religions make up our military, but nobody is exempt from being vulnerable. A member of my family, he had um, three tours of duty from the time he was 18. Well, what happened was he wanted to go back. So he went to his parents and, and said, I want to go. And they were like, that's stupid. And so what we as vets do, this is a great example, whether you're wounded where you can see it, or you're wounded where you can't see it, which is a large majority of us, when we get a pushback by any way, when we've opened up to family because they don't understand and we get that, we recoil. And unfortunately, he ended up committing suicide. The attention on the problem of suicide is important, but it's not just the problem of the veterans. Those veterans are our brothers and our sisters. It's our problem too, and we can't just sit around and feel bad for the multitudes of people who are affected by each veteran's suicide. We as a society need to step up and create new ideas to help reduce the effects of this cancer that is infiltrating hundreds of local communities throughout the country. 
you know, the first thing that this general I was mentioning talked about, he says, well, so how, what's the morale in the, well, in, the, in the army? He says, oh, it's good, very good. And I thought, Jesus, <laughs> it's very good? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I'm talking to guys who don't think it's very good at all, who don't know how they're going to deal with it, who are living in the homeless or are suicidal or are suffering the after effects of what they experienced. And sometimes that does not happen in the first year, two years, three years. It, it's before, you know, it's when you create domestic violence, when you become a drug addict, when you somehow get no longer tolerated by those around you that you are forced to, with an ultimatum to get treatment or not. So that time delay which doesn't show up in time for us to see that it actually takes place on the battlefield. Teenage sweethearts Ron and Lynette married in 1971 after his three-year stint in Vietnam. And in 1972, their son Jason was born. Ron had PTSD and emotional problems from his years in Vietnam. And in 1991, took his own life from an overdose of heroin. Their son Jason was 19 when his father died. Jason also took his life 15 years later at the age of 34. When... We spent time together. He showed me pictures of the soldiers and the Vietnamese that were dead laying in the streets that were horrifying. Um, and uh, he wouldn't, didn't want to talk about it. He showed me the pictures because I wanted to know, you know, what it was like, but he really did not want to talk about it. You know, and, and, and toward that point of, you know, treating the person as a whole person and integrating, you know, the parts of their lives and their histories, you know, from so many vets I hear that, they'll, um, that, the, that the only attention that they'll get from civilians or the only acknowledgement of their service will be people coming up to them and saying, did you kill anyone? And so that's really isolating um, one part, one aspect of them and, and doing the opposite of treating them like a whole person. That there's one thing that you learn in training and everything you do has to do with killing the enemy if you don't believe that you killed someone for moral reasons you're in an emotional dilemma a spiritual dilemma I kept wondering my disability was what the hell do I do with what this war did to me how could I use it there must be something in the middle of it that I learned that I could use and it took a lot of years of searching before I realized it's standing in front of a lot of people that want to kill themselves and being comfortable <laughs> because I did that before. And I, you know, I can talk to you if you want to kill yourself. I can say, I can confront you, I can deal with you, I can look at you, I can interact with you, I can stand in a room with you, and I'm not going to run away. I learned that somehow in my life experience the, when I spoke was planning on dying every day for thir 13 months. And so it took me a long, long time to figure that out. And once I got a hold of it, I tried to use it to do the opposite, which was to help people and not kill people. Going into service and going to war and not knowing, I believe, you know, with the best of intentions, having no idea what's going to happen to you, what are you going to become, are you going to have to do? Um, going from being a, an altar boy in church and, and living in a little New Jersey town where everything is safe and you go to school, you have friends, you go roller skating, you know, whatever normalcy you've grown up with till that age. And then it's like nothing that you've ever experienced before. And then to bring that home to people who have been living safely, then they're affected by it. Your children are affected by it. Your relatives are affected by it, your parents and it trickles out into the community. Mass shootings are becoming an increasing scourge on our society. However, most people do not realize the negative effects these events have on our veterans. 
I know what's happening as I get older. I see the thing that happened in Orlando. And, and this is what happens. So there's some kind of armor in me that's being lowered. There's something that's taking place in my, as I get older in my world, where I am feeling what's going on in society at a deeper level, which I've protected myself from since the war. The future of our country is all about supporting the younger generation. We can make a difference if we learn how to help our young veterans transition back to civilian life. Uh, in 1994 to 1996, I lived in Gainesville, Florida, and I got a call one day from a disability agency. They wanted to know if I wanted to sign up for this program with, that was happening at the University of Florida. Uh, it turned out there was a course and all the students had to give 20 hours of community service to some person with a disability in the community before they could pass the course. I signed up for it, and I met this very nice student. Uh, her name was Maribel, and every week she came and gave me two hours of attention for whatever I wanted to do. Most of the time I wanted to go shopping, or go for a long walk, or have her read me some mail or some newspaper stuff. And it was really nice. She got to learn about me as a blind vet. I got to learn about her and her life. And uh, after 10 weeks, I felt like I wasn't alone. I wasn't isolated. It really helped me a lot. I think it helped her too. Why can't we have a program like that for all vets who come back into the country who are trying to adjust back into civilian life? I really think it would go a long way. I think it would help a lot. Randy Lewis, former senior vice president of Walgreens, was instrumental in developing a work program that hired many disabled people. The goal was to have the disabled earn equal pay, just like other Walgreen employees, as long as they handled their jobs responsibly. The program has been incredibly successful. We discovered a wonderful technology. It's called ATP. Ask the person. Show them the job. Let them see if they, if they believe they can do it. For instance, in our case, if a person were to apply with one hand or one arm, our procedures say to do this safely, use two hands. So what we would do is bring the person in, let them see the job, and ask them, ask the person, how would you do this? Because they've, they've had sometimes a lifetime or years of experience of figuring all this stuff out. So we had to put that aside. The ask the person became the key technology, believe it or not, that made all this work. All of my life I was told no. Deaf people cannot serve in the military. I started to internalize that belief. Okay, deaf people can't serve. Uh, however, when I went to Israel, I learned that there are several deaf and hard of hearing Israeli soldiers and I said no way this isn't possible I, I you know I thought deaf people couldn't serve in the military uh, after spending three weeks there interviewing several of the Israeli deaf soldiers uh, I realized that there was huge potential and opportunity for the deaf and hard of hearing soldiers to serve. Deaf people for, from our standpoint it wasn't much of a disability it wasn't much of a disability. We, people didn't think, can deaf people drive? Can deaf people drive forklifts? If they can't hear their horn, how can they operate safely? Applying ATP, ask the person. We ask a deaf person, how would you test your horn? And one person says, well, I'd put my hand on the cowling and tap the horn, and I could feel it. Made sense. Second person, how would you test your horn? Well, I would pull up behind a group of people who were talking and see who jumped. Same answer. I mean, people like Procter & Gamble, Starbucks is doing this in Nevada, Lowe's is doing this big, Meyer, 
a company, a big retailer in uh, Britain is doing it, a company in Brazil, Hershey, UPS, they've all, they all come in and they see this and they go, well, I, I remember when the, the senior vice president of Lowe's came and he made a visit and called me after the visit. He said, I saw it, I got it, and I want it. And that's what happens. If other countries and successful businesses understand the value of those with disabilities, what then needs to happen for our military to begin to honor as well as value our disabled soldiers? Well, if you ask about soldiers who are high functioning, should they have a chance to transition into a non-combatant role? Of course. And here's what we found out. People with disabilities can perform as well. We studied all the numbers. They work more safely. They have less absenteeism, better retention. That's what we look for in the workforce. One thing about having a lot of people with disabilities around, they remind us all, I don't know why, but they make the workplace better. Maybe they remind us of that good person inside ourselves. It's not about pity. It's about reminding each other, it's about each other. And that translates and say, it's not about making me successful. How do I make all those around me successful? And that's why we got so excited about hiring people with disabilities. It's not just as good, it's actually better. Quite honestly, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a disability of some sort or another. If this film does what it's supposed to do, another segment of the population will wake up. And waking up is what we all need to do. But it's a two-way street. If disabled veterans would like to see positive change, then they also must step up. They must work toward a more empowered view of themselves as well as all other people with disabilities. Your perception of yourself has power. The idea that you are a victim is a myth, but as long as you believe it, it will run your life. What you perceive is what you believe. I get uh, depressed and I get frustrated with my limitations? Yes, I do. Uh, but I quickly, you know, realized that my situation could have been worse. I did a lot of great things before I lost my sight and I've been able to do a lot of great things after. We ask our soldiers to be courageous in protecting our country and our way of life. Can we as a society show that same kind of courage by reaching out to our veterans as well as our disabled vets? Recognizing that our openness to diversity is one of the things that have allowed us to be the best in the world. We must ensure that everyone who's able and willing to serve has the full and equal opportunity to do so. Embracing diversity and inclusion is critical to recruiting and retaining the force of the future. The number one impediment is fear. Fear they can't do the job. Fear uh, there'll be an accident. Fear, uh, fear of whatever. This is not a procedure we usually do. On and on and on. And the question what we had to do was say, look, let's give it our best chance. We're gonna make mistakes. But guess what? What do we do when we do anything else when we make a mistake? We fix it and we move on. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. After all, one of our most important presidents was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he skillfully and successfully guided our country through the end of World War II, possibly the darkest time in the history of our planet. And FDR was not just our president, but he was also the commander-in-chief of our military. And he did all that while spending most of his adult life in a wheelchair. In 2004, after being shot down in Iraq, Black Hawk helicopter pilot, U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Tammy Duckworth was rescued. In spite of losing limbs in the attack, she recovered 
and is now serving her country as a senator from Illinois. What I do know is that I started that day doing what I loved. I ended it knocked down, surviving only because my buddies refused to leave me and wouldn't stop even as they struggle to carry my body with its missing limbs. I worked hard, but I had a lot of help from my community and my country. And my story is not unique. It's a story about why this is the greatest nation on earth, a nation that so many are willing to die defending. A nation that says, if you keep working hard, we won't abandon you. It is inevitable that there will be a younger generation of disabled soldiers with life challenges to overcome. Their work will be to make that transition with as much grace as possible. Our job now is to strongly encourage the military to stand by those disabled soldiers and let them know they will be valued and not abandoned. In Deuteronomy, God said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. I have the will to survive. If I get what I need, stay alive. And I don't indulge in feeling so deprived. I gotta make a move get myself satisfied, satisfied, and you have the will to survive, yes you do, if you get what you need to stay alive, that's right, and you you don't indulge in feeling so deprived You gotta make a move to get yourself
Stay